So we're on page 131 of the manual at letter X there for the return from exile. Just very quickly, we'll build our chart one more time up to where we are. Genesis, the book of beginnings. Job, the book of undeserved suffering. Exodus, the book of redemption. Leviticus, the book of holiness. And again, here at the bottom, we're not moving things along historically. They're static here, happening within the time of the book. We have Numbers, the book of wanderings. Deuteronomy, the book of review. Moving into the land with Joshua, the book of conquest. And then after the Joshua's generation, the book of Judges, the book of failure. Within the time of Judges, we have the book of beauty. And then moving into the time, transitioning into the kings is the book of transition. For Samuel, where Saul is anointed king. And David also anointed, but he doesn't take the throne until 2 Samuel, where we have David on the throne, the book of David's reign. David wrote many of the Psalms, the book of praise. And the book of 1 Chronicles parallels 1 and 2 Samuel. And then when we move into the book of disruption, 1 Kings, when the kingdom splits. But first 11 chapters is about Solomon, who wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. We looked at last night. And then in chapter 12, the kingdom splits to the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And it chap- at the end of 1 Kings is 2 Kings, and that's the book of deportation, as you have both Israel and Judah, or you could call it the book of judgment for the, for the nations of Israel and Judah. Chapter 17 explains why Israel goes out. And then at the end of 2 Kings, Judah goes out in 586 B.C., 2 Chronicles parallels first and second kings and as we saw several examples yesterday of when we're missing some parts of the story in first kings chronicles fills in those gaps now within second kings you start having the writing prophets we have the northern prophets of amos and hosea we have the foreign nations jonah nahum and obadiah both jonah and nahum deal with assyria obadiah deals with edom now with uh If you keep in mind that you only have two to the northern kingdom, Amos and Hosea, and you can remember Jonah, Nahum, and Obadiah as prophets to uh, the foreign nations, then you know all the rest before the captivity are in the southern, or prophets to the southern kingdom. Joel, Isaiah, and Micah are contemporaries, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, and Jeremiah. So all of those are in the southern kingdom. So it's not as hard to keep together as you might think if you just find you some key things to remember then you can know just by default who the others are writing to. With the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C., Jeremiah wrote the book of Lamentations as he saw the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem. And that brings us to the time of the captivity. And you have two authors during the time of the captivity, Daniel and Ezekiel. Then after the captivity, we start having the returns, and that's Ezra, the book of returns, and that's where we're going to begin this morning. So on page 131, the return from exile, the time of Haggai, Zechariah, Ezra, Esther, Nehemiah, and Malachi, the post-exilic prophets and writers. So you have three post-exilic prophets prophecies or prophets and that's Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So if you remember the northern kingdom prophets you got two. Remember the four nation prophets you got three. And then you remember post-exilic you got three of those. And you just remember Daniel and Ezekiel are in the captivity. Then you know all the rest of them are prophets to the southern kingdom before the captivity. So just little key reminders. Prophets prophesied the return to the land numerous times. We find Isaiah prophesying this. We find um, uh, Jeremiah prophesying this. We also see it within, mainly in the southern kingdom prophets like Micah and then with uh, Zephaniah and some of the others like that. So three returns. This is a chart on the three returns. The first return, 536 B.C., was led by Zerubbabel for the purpose of rebuilding the temple. On page 131. And when you get to the return to rebuild the temple, they start and then they get discouraged and they stop. And it's later, in about 520, when you have the ministries of Haggai and Zechariah, they come to help encourage Israel to finish rebuilding the temple. So it doesn't finish until about 518, but the first return was in 536. 
The second return was led by Ezra, and this was for the purpose of restoring the law in 457 B.C. And then the third return was led by Nehemiah for the purpose of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem in 444 B.C. And as we saw last night, that's the decree that starts the clock of Daniel's 70 weeks running, according to Daniel 9, 24, and 25. Now, Isaiah, or sorry, the, to the return to Jerusalem and the land would not have surprised those Israelites who understood Old Testament prophecies. Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28 talked about the return to land when they would always be there and never be removed. Now, when you get to Isaiah and Jeremiah, he, they talk about a return of not everyone, but a return of some of them to the land. Deuteronomy and Leviticus are looking way down the quarter of time to when Messiah comes to establish the kingdom in the land of Israel. Isaiah wrote about the return to the land and the importance of the captivity for Israel. God was using the captivity to discipline Israel, his chosen nation, his, the redeemed nation. He's disciplining them so they will walk in his ways. And we saw in Daniel 9.24 why the 70 weeks are important, especially the last one is to bring it into iniquity, to establish Jerusalem, all these different things, so that they are in the land planted forever not to be removed. The writer of the Chronicles described the captivity and return to the land as fulfillment of prophecy. Second Chronicles 36, 20-21. I'm just going to quickly turn over there. Should have already been there. So last part of the book. It says, those who had escaped from the sword, he carried away to Babylon, and they were servants to him and to his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days of its desolation, it kept Sabbath until 70 years were complete. Remember, that's what had prompted Daniel to study Jeremiah and to try to figure out what was going to happen next because he realized he was living at the end of those 70 years. But he was missing something. The next thing on Daniel's prophetic agenda, according to all that they had in the Old Testament at that time, was the kingdom. But God wasn't going to establish the kingdom yet. There was going to be a return to remnant. And then that was one of those returns. The third one is going to start that clock running that runs 490 years with an interruption before the last seven years of that 490. And so this would have been prophesied and the author of Chronicles mentions it as a fulfillment of prophecy to fulfill the word of the Lord. For 70 years, idolatry and the pagan life of the cultural capital of the world, Babylon, surrounded the Judean captives. So they, they were back into a time of where they had to deal with the idolatry in the land of Babylon. After the captivity, those Jews who did not return to Israel made the synagogue the place for study and worship. And this is important when you start looking in the Gospels. This important development impacted the life of Jesus Christ and the ministry of Paul. We have several passages there. When you, when you go from the Old Testament, from Malachi right into Matthew, you've got things going on. You've got a new empire. It's not the Persians. It's the Romans. And you have synagogues. The Lord teaching in synagogues. No synagogues in the Hebrew Scriptures. Where did these things come from? They are a result of the dispersion after the captivity. As Jews immigrated all over the world, they built synagogues, Old Testament places for study. Or really, rather, places to study the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. They would have the Torah readings, the parashas. They'd go through the Hebrew Scriptures uh, throughout the year. Synagogues were not substitutes for the temple because sacrifices were never offered in them. They still would go to Jerusalem for the feasts, at least some would. You had three feasts that you were to go to every year, Passover, Unleavened Bread, and Pentecost. Thankfully, Passover and Unleavened Bread coincided with one another. In the synagogue, scribes who became prominent during the captivity made manual copies of the Old Testament Scriptures. They made manual copies of the Old Testament Scriptures. And later on, these scribes are going to hide the... The, what their work is in the Qumran caves, the Dead Sea Scrolls that are discovered. And when those things are discovered, it's interesting when it happens with the height of liberalism trying to discredit Scripture. 
when that evidence is discovered, we realize that the text has not gone through many changes because those, those that date into the, around the 70 A.D. match the copies we have that are, that are later than that, that go beyond. So they were very meticulous and it verifies that God has overseen the preservation of the text of Scripture. After Pentecost, the first Christian converts emerged from these centers. Paul would always go to a synagogue first. And then when he got rejected, then he would go to the Gentiles. Sometimes, like in Corinth, he'd get kicked out of the synagogue. He'd just move next door and start teaching. And, and then the synagogue leader would start following Paul, and the people in the synagogue get all upset, or the Jews there get all upset. Many Judeans prospered during the captivity, including Daniel and his friends. Many Judeans wrongly decided to stay in Babylon and not return to Judea because they refused to leave their comfortable surroundings and were willing to compromise with the world's evil religious systems. Now that's a very strong statement in, in light of the fact that Daniel doesn't return, and he could have. Of course, he was very old at the time. He may have died right as the return is going to happen. Hard to say. But they were not to be sent there and then... God was going to bring them back. But because they chose to stay there, they didn't all come back. So this can't be the fulfillment of the return of all Israel to the land. That's still got to be a future fulfillment. God used the Israelites who did not return to the land to spread a biblical worldview built from the Hebrew Scriptures. Their dispersion helped spread the Gospel during the first century A.D. It's no accident that in the 500s B.C., after God reveals His prophetic plan to Daniel, that all of a sudden you have, you haven't had, uh, pagan religion had been static for over a thousand years. There have been no new developments. And then right at the time as the Jews get dispersed and Daniel gets this new revelation, which was in the mind of God given to Daniel, but who would be listening in? Satan would be listening in. And as Satan gets new information, all of a sudden at that same time, you have reformations throughout the world of the pagan religious systems. In Buddhism, you have it in, with the uh, pre-Socratic development of, of philosophy. You have it with Zoroastrianism in Persia. All of a sudden, religions start developing greater, and they get an eschatology. They get an end times view, which they didn't have before. And now that Satan knew God's end time scheme, now he developed his own perverted end time scheme. And it's just rather interesting that it coincides. You study history along with what happened in the Bible at the same time. You can see the connection. We'll see more of that when we study just Daniel. All right, Ezra 1 through 6, the first return. The Assyrians, who had taken the Jews from the land, scattered them across the empire to sever every tie to their land and religion. They mixed ethnic groups to create chaos in order to establish order and discourage rebellion. In other words, they took the Jews of the northern kingdom and they would put some here, some there, some over here, and then they would take other people groups from another part of the world they'd conquered and they brought them into Israel to intermingle and intermarry with those and this kept them from uniting together against this Syrian empire. And what's interesting is that the Assyrians operated on a chaotic worldview. You know, chaos brings order. And yet, they organize their own chaos. And so, it's a, it's, it goes against their own presuppositional position to do what they did. But it did, did work. It kept the people groups they had conquered from rising up against them, along with their psychological warfare. I mean, these guys would come in, and when they would conquer, they would impale people, and they would leave the roads just with impaled people along the side. It scared people to death. The last thing you wanted to do was fall prey to the Assyrians. The Babylonians, on the other hand, used their captives as slaves. God judged them for their bad treatment of the Judeans, as we saw what God told Habakkuk. But nonetheless, they kept the people groups together. Now here's a map of the Persian Empire. Remember that Nebuchadnezzar, or the, let's start with the Assyrian. The Assyrian Empire had been about this size, and then Babylon's empire grew a little bit bigger, and now you have this aspect of the empire, and then when Alexander comes along, he's going to conquer all the, way, all the way to India. It's going to grow, and then when the Romans come along, well, it goes off the map. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger each time we have a conquest. The Persians attempted to engender gratitude, not hatred, in their captives. 
And it's interesting, as we talked about with Daniel, he's a man high up in position in the Babylonian Empire, and the Persians conquer, and then he gets a position high up in the Persian Empire. That's unheard of. Uh, it's like today, normally you don't have the same person being the head of, whether it's Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense, whatever, in different administrations of different parties. That's kind of you know, a little unusual, although we have had that happen in recent history. They sent captives back to their homeland with the right to reestablish their preferred system of worship. The Persians were very tolerant, at least under Cyrus. And they were very tolerant of as long as the religious system they were doing didn't go against the state. Didn't harbor some sort of coup against the state. Yahweh used this unique policy to fulfill the promise he had made almost 200 years before in Isaiah 44. Interesting verbiage used there by Isaiah to describe Cyrus. Isaiah 44, 26, confirming the word of his servant, performing the purpose of his messengers. It is I who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited. And of the cities of Judah, they shall be built. And I will raise up their ruins again. This is after Babylon has destroyed it. It is I who says to the depth of the sea, be dried up. And I will make your rivers dry. It is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. And he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built. And of the temple, your foundation will be laid. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed. The word Mashiach for Messiah, which means anointed. Whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him. And to loose the loins of kings. To open doors before him, so the gates will not be shut. He, it's the prophecy of Cyrus to, to allow Israel back to the land to rebuild the temple. And this happens hundreds of years before it's fulfilled. Helpful insights come from comparing Ezra 1.1 1, 1 with Jeremiah 25.12, 29.10-14, 27.21-22. And when we, for the lack of time, we're not going to do that right now, but it, it's interesting to compare those passages together We get insights on the fulfillment of this prophecy. Few Judeans, and when you consider the number that were out there, chose to return to the land compared to the number living in the empire. Few Judeans chose to return. Ezra 2, 64 and 65, Ezra gave the number of returnees, the ones whose spirit God stirred with a desire to return to the land. Ezra 1, verse 5, Then the heads of fathers, household of Judah, and Benjamin, and the priests, and the Levites arose, everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord is in Jerusalem. He goes through and lists all the numbers later on in the chapter. Ezra 3, 1 through 7, when the people arrived, they assembled in Jerusalem and promptly constructed an altar for sacrifices. So they have a functional altar during this time, but they're not going to have the functional temple for a while. They're going to start rebuilding the temple, and they're going to face opposition, and it's going to discourage them, and we're going to need ministries of two prophets to get it back going. When the Babylonians defeated Judah and sacked Jerusalem, they left the land to the poor, who were not at all pleased about the returned remnant. especially the Samaritans, which was the intermingling of the people of Israel that were left there and then the people that the Assyrians brought in. You had a mixed crowd, and Ezra's not going to allow them to participate. There's a rebel first, and then Ezra and Nehemiah later in the rebuilding of the wall or the temple. The second year, 536 B.C., they began rebuilding the temple, Ezra 3, 8-13. And Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, and Zechariah are the most historically precise books in the Old Testament as they date things. The second year of the reign of so-and-so or the first month of the second day of the reign of so-and-so. They are very precise with their dating system in their books. Makes us wish all the authors had done that. The Jews refused to allow the pagan Samaritans to help with the temple rebuilding, so they actively opposed it. The Samaritans tried to stop it. They sent emissaries and tried to get the government to stop it. Thus began a satanic attack to, attack to prevent the rebuilding of the temple. Satanic attempt to prevent the rebuilding of the temple. Ezra 4, 1 through 524, the temple rebuilding ceased for at least 16 years. They decided, well, you know, uh, can't, you know we're just going to build our own homes. 
since we can't finish the Lord's house. And then that's going to be what Haggai is going to say something about that later. Ezra 5, 1 through 2, God responded by raising up Haggai and Zechariah to exhort the people to continue the rebuilding. Ezra 5, verse 1, when the prophets Haggai and the prophet Zechariah, the son of Edu, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. They challenged them to rebuild, finish rebuilding the temple. In 520 B.C., the second year of King Darius' rule, after 16 years of no building, the work on the temple resumed. And again, Haggai marks that date very specifically. In the second year of Darius the king, on the first day of the sixth month. Boom. We can nail it. We know when Darius was his second year, and we can look at the date on that. So in the book of Haggai, the book of procrastination, we call it that because they had been procrastinating regarding the building of the temple. Haggai 1.1, during the first return, Haggai, whose name means festive or festival, prophesied in order to motivate the people to finish the temple. This was his purpose. And so the ministry of Haggai and the ministry of Zechariah is going to overlap. Haggai's is going to be much shorter Zechariah is going to go on longer, and it's a longer book. It's a major, minor prophet as far as the size is concerned. Verse 2, the Lord rebuked the people for their lazy attitude toward rebuilding the temple. Thus says the Lord of hosts, this people says, the time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, it is time, or is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? I mean, you guys are living in your homes. What about the home for the Lord, the temple? This was the challenge. Haggai 1, 3 through 15 is his first message. 3 through 6, the first message rebuked the remnant for placing their own interest ahead of God's. Their creature comforts were more important to them than their worship of Yahweh. So we can see sort of the apathy, even though they had the zeal to return, as soon as they met some pressure, apathy set in and they didn't finish what they'd started out. Verses 7 through 11, Haggai commanded them to rebuild the temple and called for them to consider your ways. That's key phrase there. Verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Consider what you're doing. Consider your motivation. Consider why you're doing what you're doing. 12 through 15, the people responded by resuming work on the temple. They responded by resuming work on the temple. But then we move into the second message of Haggai, chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. First three verses, the historical setting was the Feast of Tabernacles, which pictured the coming of the kingdom. We haven't said much about the feast. We do a lot of that in the life of Christ because it comes up so often in the life of Christ, whether it's Passover, Tabernacles, whatever it may be. But that's what that feast pictured. It was a, it's the fall feast picturing the coming of the kingdom. The spring feasts were all fulfilled in Christ, the first advent. The fall feasts are fulfilled in his second advent. Haggai 2, 4 through 5, the command to take courage and promise of the Lord's presence showed them that God's word brings encouragement. He says, but now take courage, Zerubbabel, who was leading the return. Take courage also, Joshua, who's the high priest. And all you people of the land, take courage. I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. My presence is with you. 6 through 9, Haggai gave further encouragement about the future of the temple. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. Now, the third message, Haggai 2, 10 through 19. On December 18th, 520 B.C., it's also the same time we have Zechariah begins his ministry. He had the exact same timing. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, on the 24th of the ninth month in the second year of Darius. So we're in the second year of Darius, a month apart. So Zechariah's ministry had begun, and now Haggai's got a message that coincides with Zechariah. Haggai 2, 11 through 13, God designed these questions to make the people think about their motivations. It says, ask now the priest for a ruling. If a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread with his fold or cook food with wine or oil or any other food, will it become holy? And the priest answered, no. 
Then Haggai said, If one who is unclean from a corpse touches any of these, will the latter become unclean? And the priest answered, It will become unclean. They knew the answer, but they weren't living these things out in the reality uh, of building the temple. So in verse 14, the Lord expressed displeasure with the people's work and offerings. They needed, they were unclean. They needed to check their motivations, consider their ways. God explained that he disciplined them to bring them back to him, verses 15 through 17. <clears throat> Haggai 2, 18 through 19, God promised them blessing in the future for obedience, but punishment in the present for disobedience. The blessing in the far future will be related to the coming of Messiah, the Advent, second Advent. And then his fourth message. So Haggai has four sermons, basically. Verse 20, this message came on the same day as the third message. You have the same dating. He just continues speaking, but he also dates it on the 24th day of the month. And this is pretty much directed at Zerubbabel. The purpose of this message was to encourage Zerubbabel. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, the Lord says. I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. So 21b through 22, God promised violent disruptions to judge the various governments and people groups and usher in the Messianic kingdom. So this is far. So we have near far again within this. The near is going to be fulfilled with the temple being finished as the recognition God's presence is there. And that's literally fulfilled, and it looks forward now to the far fulfillment of when the kingdom will be set up. So we continue to have this near-far principle given to us. 23a, on that day, refers to the day Messiah will return to establish his earthly kingdom. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Sheatil, my servant, declares the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. God designed the entire message to encourage Zerubbabel to keep leading the returned remnant of Israel. In that part of verse 23, it gets expanded upon in Zechariah's visions. We get more understanding of it. And very quickly, we want to look at a New Testament connection. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. Paul writing to the Corinthians who they are believers in Christ, but they're not living like it. They're doing all sorts of things. And thank God for the Corinthian church because every problem we have in the church today, you can just about go back to Corinth and look at what was going on and get some understanding on how to deal with these problems. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, he says, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? And he asked that question rhetorically with the assumption, yes, you know this. This is something you should know at least. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, he says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. So with that understanding, therefore, glorify God in your body. Live a certain way. Live out the reality of your salvation in Christ. Church-age believers are the temple of God and should live lives of service set apart unto Him. Paul says we are to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. Not dead sacrifices like in the old system. They would bring something alive to kill it to worship. Well, the Lamb of God has been slaughtered on our behalf so that now we can come to God and offer ourselves as living sacrifices and it can take place anywhere because we're the temple. We take the temple with us. We take the Holy Spirit where we go. Every aspect of the temple was set apart unto God. We saw that with the tabernacle, whether it was the lampstand, the altar, the ark, whatever it is, everything was set apart unto God. And so we are to set ourselves apart, but we can't do it. It's God the Holy Spirit that does it. We are to present ourselves as servants of righteousness with a mindset that we reckon ourselves dead to sin in Christ. Romans 6, you tie all these things together. God wants us by faith to present the members of our bodies as instruments of righteousness unto him since we are dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, there's that Romans 6, 10 through 14. Our motivations, method of thinking, history, economics, politics, everything must be considered in light of God's word, a Bible first epistemology. That is, we take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. We must constantly use God's word to examine our way of life. 
so that we live in conformity to God's will. This was a major message in Haggai. Consider your ways. Consider your ways. Think about what you're doing. Think about why you're doing what you're doing. And think about it in light of glorifying God. Our thinking leads to actions. Our actions develop habits. Our habits shape our lifestyle. And our lifestyle determines our future rewards or lack thereof. The evaluation throne of Christ will hash all that out. Determine what's of value and what's not of value. What's there that has value for eternity, God rewards. And it's to His glory because He did it through us. It's not us doing it. Everything in life depends on whether we have our minds set on God which leads to life and peace, or on the flesh, which leads to corruption. Mindset on the flesh is death. Mindset on the spirit is life and peace. We live according to the flesh. We cannot please God. We are all products of our thinking. That's why Paul deals with it everywhere, whether it's in Philippians, Colossians, Romans. It's all about having the right thinking, and then that produces the right motivation and the right actions. Zechariah, the book of Messiah. Same time as Haggai. Zechariah 1.1. Zechariah, which means Yahweh remembers, prophesied at the same time as Haggai to encourage Israel to finish rebuilding the temple. Prophesied at the same time as Haggai to encourage Israel to finish rebuilding the temple. The structure of the book can be remembered by the formula 842. You have eight visions, four sermons or messages, and two burdens. 842. Zechariah 1-6. 842. We're going to do it right here. It's coming up right here. That's all right. Eight visions, verses 1-6. through six. Four messages, chapters 7 through 8, and two burdens, chapters 9 through 14. Zechariah is a book that very rarely studied in any real depth. Uh, it's my favorite minor prophet, so you can imagine how I got into a little depth with it. And we're going to buckle up here in a moment and zoom through Zechariah. Don't expect to retain all of it, I just want to get you to see the big picture of what's going on in the book of Zechariah. Application thought before we go to this. A believer must understand the message in the book of Zechariah to understand God's prophetic program. This is where a lot of mistakes are made in coming to the book of Revelation. You cannot understand the book of Revelation if you don't first understand at least Daniel, Zechariah, probably throw Ezekiel in there, and some major parts of Jeremiah and Isaiah. The symbols that are used in Revelation are first interpreted in Daniel, Ezekiel, and Zechariah. And then they are enhanced or improved, not, not improved upon, but a greater understanding from that in the book of Revelation. So you can't just jump into Revelation. There's a reason it's at the back of the book. We read the whole other first. And then we have a... But most time, you know, you start a study on Revelation, people start coming out of the woodwork. And then they get problems because they don't have the background that you spent years developing with those you've been, been training and, and teaching. And they come in without all of that, and it's, it's hard. There's a lot to take in, and Zechariah has a lot of the keys. Many pro prophecy misunderstandings come from ignoring this important minor prophet. Come from ignoring this important minor prophet. The New Testament quotes or alludes to Zechariah at least 40 times. Now any book, the New, any book that the New Testament quotes this many times means we need to study the book. Just like the Lord quotes Deuteronomy over and over again in his life, that warrants a study of Deuteronomy. So Zechariah is an important book. I mean, it's small as far as chapters. You've got 14 chapters, and some of it's... Not really redundant, but it's the same thing being explained several different times, different ways. And it's quoted 40 times, or at least alluded to and quoted. We need to look at it. Messianic prophecy dominates the book of Zechariah. All other minor prophets combined do not give the amount of information about the Messiah found in Zechariah. 
course, again, it's also 14 chapters, whereas most of the minor prophets are a lot less. But still, there's a lot of understanding of Messiah in this book. Zechariah not only dealt with the first advent of Messiah, but also the second advent. And it's got that same problem that you see in Isaiah 61 where you read, the fa proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, and then the next, uh, next phrase is in the day of vengeance. And yet the Lord puts this gap in it. Zechariah is filled with that. And you'll be reading, and you'll be in the first advent, and then you'll be 70 AD, then you'll be back here, and then you'll be way out there, and you'll be back here, and it just jumps back and forth. We're going to have to chart that out. The principle that God controls history is illustrated throughout the book of Zechariah. That understanding both comforts and encourages. That's why prophecy is given. Prophecy is not given just so we can uh, you know, be knowledgeable. It's given for comfort. It's given to encourage. It's given to motivate. And when you understand where you fit into God's plan, it becomes real to you. you can, it, it becomes interesting. When you're not sure where you fit into God's plan, whether you're saved or not, or whether, uh, where you fit as far as the church or Israel, you don't want to deal with it because there's so much detail and it's overwhelming. But when you know where you can anchor who you are in Christ and where you fit into the plan, now you've got something to stick all these details on. In Zechariah's time, the people of Israel were uncertain about their future and unsure about the value of their efforts. They're building the temple, and they got all this opposition, and they're like, What's, you know, why bother? Remember Haggai said, consider your ways, and they did, and they came to the wrong conclusion at first. And then Zechariah steps in to motivate them on why they need to do it. Our eternal future is secure, and our efforts to serve the Lord in time have great value. Paul says the light affliction that's temporary is nothing in comparison to the eternal weight of glory. That awaits us. All right, now just sit back for a second, and we're just going to zoom through Zechariah, and then we'll come back and fill in the manual for a minute. Zechariah, return to the Lord, and he may return to you. This is a refrain we see several times in the opening section. Remember the 842 eight visions, four messages, two burdens. We're going to start with the eight visions. Vision number one, the report of the nations being at ease while Israel is in distress prompts the wrath of God to come against the nations. You've got this vision of the horse riders and one is the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ and all these others are reporting to him. They're the angelic recon team going out to and fro, learning there, reporting back to the eternal son. Then the eternal son goes to the father to report what's going on. And the nations are at rest or at ease or at peace while Israel is is not, and this is going to prompt God to take action. So vision number two, from Zechariah's historical position, the horn of Babylon had already been disciplined by the Persian craftsmen. You have the same type of deal here that we saw in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 as these horns are the different kingdoms that conquer the next one, and the craftsmen, they coincide with the lion or with the head of gold, with the bear, the breast of silver, with the four-headed leper, or the bronze belly, and then the indescribable beast, or the legs of iron. They coincide with that, and they even reach all the way to the time of Daniel's 70th week, or the time of Jacob's trouble. So you've got near-far aspects within the vision. Vision number three, God will restore Jerusalem and dwell in Zion after the nations have been judged. When the final craftsman comes to judge, and the horn comes, that's going to be the Lord Jesus Christ setting up the kingdom, ruling from Jerusalem, those things we saw before with the second peak of prophecy that the Pharisees focused on more than the suffering of the first peak. Vision four, God encouraged the high priest Joshua and looks forward to the time when the branch will come and cleanse the land of all iniquity. The branch of Jesse, the branch of David, is the Lord Jesus Christ, Messiah. He will cleanse the land of all iniquity. And there will no longer be false prophets or false teachings in the land of Israel. That's a future, but there were some things happening in the present that encouraged Joshua the high priest to move on with Zerubbabel in the rebuilding of the temple. Vision 5, God encourages Zerubbabel in the rebuilding of the temple and places emphasis on a future time when the office of priest and king will be united. That's the picture of the lampstand with the two olive trees. The priesthood and the kingship being united in the one person of Messiah, the anointed one, which the lampstand was anointed, set apart for worship. 
And then you start moving into my favorite parts of the visions, vision six. A severe and complete judgment will occur quickly in the land, the land of Israel, making the glorious existence of Israel possible. The flying scroll is the law, and there's going to be a complete fulfillment for Israel so that there's no, there's no more sin in Israel. We saw they will no longer lie. They'll have a new spirit put in them. They'll have a, a new heart. We saw those passages in Ezekiel. And this is setting up for the time of the iniquity brought to completion of Daniel's 70th week. And it's also the next vision coincides with that with idolatry being judged. Idolatry will be removed from the land of Israel and taken to the place of its origination to be finally and completely judged. This is where you had the little woman in the ephah. And the little woman, the angel lifts the top off and says, see the little woman in the ephah? Goes, yeah, I see the little woman. Who is it? And she's idolatry. And he slams the, sh the lid shut back on it. And these unclean women with, with stork wings take it back to Shinar, where idolatry originated. That's where it's going to be judged. Revelation 17 and 18 fulfills this and coincides with this. Vision 8, God's wrath is carried out on the nations of the earth with the branch uniting the priesthood and kingship offices to rule Israel in perfect peace forever. Now, that's the eight visions. Now we move to the four messages, 842. In, in essence, God informs Israel of their need to check their motives. This coincides with Haggai's message of consider your ways. Challenges them to walk in obedience and encourages them with a promise of restoration and the resultant joy of God's zeal for Zion. So it has an impact on the present, but the complete fulfillment of it is still far into the future. Now we come to the burdens. Now, we need to recognize our timeline from last night with the statue of Daniel here or Nebuchadnezzar. The belly of bronze is Greece. The legs of iron is Rome. And then the feet of iron and clay, we have that. That's when this will be in the tribulation. So they're trying to keep that all matched together there. Nothing about the church in Zechariah. Nothing about the church in the Old Testament. But this is all called the times of the Gentiles. So, but the destruction of the temple in 70 AD takes place during the church age. Now, this thing's going to jump around. And so we're going to do it as we see it in Scripture first, back and forth, back and forth. And then we'll do it in our Western mindset of chronological, because that's the only way I can think. I can't think not chronologically. The first prophecy is a near prophecy in Zechariah 9, 1 through 8, and that's about Alexander taking Tyre and Sidon. And so it's fulfilled near, not in Zechariah's time, but not long after, a generation and a half, two, three generations later, it's fulfilled literally. So all the rest will be filled literally as well. Then he jumps here to the end of the tribulation. And then he jumps here in Zechariah 9b and Zechariah 9.10 uh, where we have the, it should be, it should be Zechariah 9.9 9, where he is mounted on the foal of a donkey. He's presenting himself to Israel. Then we jump back to the end of the tribulation again when he's going to set up and come and judge the nations. And then 1 through 3a describes in summary the whole time of the tribulation period or Daniel's 70th week. And then we have another emphasis here on the coming of Christ when he's going to bring an end to the iniquity and the end to the tribulation. Then we go to this 75 day interval. And that 75 day interval comes from looking at numbers in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12 where when the Lord comes, there's going to be 75 days of cleanup and other things, judgment of the nations and all that, before the kingdom actually gets started. Then he jumps back to the destruction of the temple, and he describes it with the cedars of, of Lebanon and the oaks. They wail. It's the destruction of the temple that's in mind. And that's going to be the focus of this first burden. Note the first burden of Zechariah 9-11. through Then he goes back to the midpoint of the hypostatic union with the shepherd. He has to act out this role. He tells Zechariah to act this out. And this is when the Lord Jesus Christ as the good shepherd is rejected by Israel by those who are teaching Israel the wrong way. This is all prophesied here. Then he comes back to the temple. Zechariah 11, 10-11. Then we come back to the... Uh, in Zechariah 11, 12 through 13, when he is betrayed, 30 pieces of silver, the price of the fuller's field, all that's prophesied right here. And all of that is quoted in Matthew during the Passion Week. Then the last part here uh, on the temple, 11, 14, is the destruction of the temple. They rejected the shepherd, the true shepherd. The last, very last part of this burden focuses on them accepting the Antichrist. Let's zoom back to that. 
So look at the focus of the first burden. The focus of the first burden is primarily right here on the destruction of the temple and on the judgment in connection to this because even the Lord coming here, is, is, the wordage is focused on the judgment of Israel, the finish of the iniquity and what's necessary for Israel to now enter the land under the kingdom. Now, if all you had was this, it leaves on the burden of them accepting the false shepherd. And that's not very comforting. So now let's look at the second burden. The second burden begins with a focus on the beginning of the tribulation, or right before it, where he makes Jerusalem a cup of reeling and all the things that are going to take place to start the tribulation period. Then he jumps toward the end as things are going to be ramping up with the anti-Semitism right before the Lord comes. And then the Lord comes in the second advent in Zechariah 12 to 3.1. And then the destructions of the false prophet. There will no longer be false prophecy in the land. They drop out of there. Then he comes back to the hypostatic union. He jumps back over here in Zechariah 13, 7 at a time of the ministry of Christ. He focuses on the temple just the one time in this one. The rest of the time, we've got the midpoint of the tribulation. We've got the end of the tribulation. We've got the end of the tribulation, the coming of Christ, summary of the kingdom, and the rock that falls and breaks the feet of the statue, and then a focus on the kingdom again. Look at the difference in the focus on the burden. The first burden focused here on the destruction of the temple, and that's a, that, that would be a big burden uh, for Israel and would not be very comforting. But the second burden focuses on the coming of Messiah to establish the kingdom. That's where the comfort comes from. So the second burden ends on a message of hope and comfort. Now, let's chart it out straight and watch how it works out this way. That's the near part fulfilled by Alexander the Great. Then we get these prophecies in the hypostatic union. Destruction of the temple. Look at all those about the destruction of the temple, but there was only one in the second burden like that. Now we get a summary of what takes place during the 70th week of Daniel. The emphasis on accepting the false shepherd, what's going to happen to the false shepherd, and boom, look at all that about the second coming of Christ. And then we get rid of the false prophet and the antichrist, and now we have the establishment of the kingdom, and that's what the final burden focuses on. That gives them comfort. That gives them hope. And again... That's zooming through Zechariah in a very short period of time. <laughs> now let's talk it out just real quick. The first vision. The report that Gentile nations were at ease while Israel was in distress prompted the wrath of God to come against the nations. By the way, you'll get these PowerPoints and so what you can do when, when you get that chart on the PowerPoints, then just read through the Scriptures as they come up on the chart and you can see where it fits in there and you get the, get the details into your mind a little bit better. Uh, when I was teaching that, I had, no one, I had never seen a chart on Zechariah before. I didn't have any, any charts to go. I thought maybe at least Clarence Larkin would have had a chart on it, but he didn't have a chart on it. So that's why you're stuck with mine. Yeah. <laughs> He has some references to it, but not a full just on the book of Zechariah. So I'm, you're, I'm sorry you're stuck with mine. The second vision, from Zechariah's position in history, Persian craftsmen had already disciplined the Horn of Babylon. Persian craftsmen had already disciplined the Horn of Babylon. And all these visions, by the way, happen at uh, one night. He'll, he'll fall asleep and the angel will come, get up, look, see what you see. What do you see? Well, I see such and such. Do you know what it is? And I'm always like, well, if, you know, because he, he asks. He says, what is it? He says, you don't know? Well, if I wouldn't have known, I wouldn't have asked. That would have been my response. The angel would probably have slapped me. But he says, no, I don't know. He gets the angel to interpret what he sees for him. And the angel gives us the understanding that we need in these visions. The third vision. After God judges the nations, he will restore Jerusalem and dwell in Zion. So much of these points are similar to what we had on the slide presentation there uh, just a moment ago. And again, you can read through the, the passages uh, and see these different visions. And they're clearly highlighted out as different, by the way, like in chapter 3, verse 1. Then he showed me. Then he showed me. Or then I lifted up my eyes and saw something along those lines separate them out. The fourth vision. God encouraged the high priest Joshua and look forward to the time when the branch will come and cleanse the land of all iniquity. If we had time, we could develop out branch theology a little bit, which is about the Lord Jesus Christ. The branch or the root of Jesse and all that goes with it. 
the fifth vision, God encouraged Zerubbabel in rebuilding the temple and emphasized the future time when the offices of priest and king will be united. We only looked at one example, but remember when Uzziah tried as king to offer incense and be a priest, what happened to him? Every time a king tried to unite the king and priesthood together, there was discipline for them. That is reserved for Messiah and Messiah alone, and it will come about when we have the kingdom. The sixth vision, a severe and complete judgment will occur quickly in the land, making the glorious existence of Israel possible. That's the flying scroll of it. The seventh vision, idolatry will be removed from the land of Israel and taken to the place of its origination to be finally and completely judged. And it coincides with the judgment of the false prophet um, that takes place in everything that goes along with it. The, the height of idolatry will be fulfilled there and that place where it originated will be utterly destroyed. And it's an interesting study to parallel Revelation chapter 17 and 18 with Jeremiah 50 and 51 and go back and forth between them and you see the, almost the same thing going on. The eighth vision. Oh, and when I say it is the same thing, but you almost see verbatim the same verbiage. The eighth vision. God's wrath will be carried out on the nations of the earth with the branch uniting the priesthood and kingship offices to rule Israel in perfect peace. Again, we're still waiting for this. All Again, Alexander literally conquered Tyre and Sidon. And what we see in these visions is repeated in the burden at some level. And if Alexander literally conquered Tyre and Sidon, then we've got to have literal fulfillment of these other things or we wouldn't know when they happen. God commanded Israel to evaluate their motives challenge them to walk in obedience, and encourage them with a promise of restoration and the resultant joy of God's zeal. God's zeal for Zion. And that's what the burdens were for. The burden ended on a message of hope. The second one did. The first one didn't, but the second one didn't. But the first one ends on their rejection, which has to take place. And then the second one ends on the message of comfort and hope when they do accept the shepherd, the great shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me get a new uh, PowerPoint up. At the last time I have to do that. So we have Esther, the rest of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Malachi. The book of Esther is the book of providence. The book of providence. The reason we call it that is because God's not mentioned in the book, but he's working behind the scenes. The book of Esther, which fits time-wise between chapters 6 and 7 of Ezra, provides the only scriptural information about those Judeans who voluntarily remained in Persia. And the ones that are there are threatened in this book with extinction. Esther 1, 1 through 3, in 483 B.C., Ashuerus, also known as Xerxes, was in the third year of his reign and had not yet fought the Battle of Salamis. And he's needing to get support to do so. The Battle of Salamis is a major naval battle where the Greeks whip the Persians. Xerxes sitting up on the mountain, and he watches it, and he's disgusted with it. And he has to go back uh, across the Hellespont, and he comes back to Persia, and then he will marry Esther when he comes back from this battle. He was preparing for his invasion of Greece and held a banquet for the subordinates of his empire. And it's at this banquet that Vashti spurns him. And he looks like a weak king among those he's trying to get support to go to battle for. So it says, shed some insight on what's going on and why he reacts the way he does. You can't look weak when you're trying to get money to go to battle. You've got to look strong. Perhaps he wanted to impress these nobles to gain their help in the invasion. At least that's my position. But note we put the word perhaps there just for a little wiggle room. It doesn't have to be this way, but that fits best with the data we have. Esther 1, 10 through 11. With everyone drunk, the king wanted to display Queen Vashti's beauty, but she refused to obey him. She doesn't come. 
So in Esther 1.12, Queen Vashti's refusal established a national crisis for King Ahasuerus. Then the king became very angry and his wrath burned within him. He refu her, refus excuse me, her refusal threatened his honor and the social supremacy of the men of Persia. So even if it's not a banquet to try to raise support for his invasion of Greece, he still doesn't want to lose face. Esther 119, Queen Vashti was no longer allowed access to the king. If it pleases the king, let a royal edict be issued by him and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Medes so that it cannot be repeat, repealed. That Vashti may no longer come into the presence of King Ahasuerus and let the king give her royal position to another who is more worthy than she. So he doesn't necessarily execute her, but now he, she can't come around anymore. She's going to have to be basically banished. Esther 2, 1 through 4, the nation was searched for a new queen. <coughs> Excuse me. Maidens were brought from all parts of the empire, and one of these maidens was Esther. Esther 2.9, Esther immediately found favor in the eyes of the keeper of the women who gave her the best accommodations in the house. It says, now the young lady pleased him and found favor with him, so he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and food, gave her seven choice maids from the king's palace, and transferred her and her maids to the best place in the harem. Now, this isn't often very popular, but historically, this is how it happens. This is not a beauty contest. This is a contest to see who can please the king sexually the best. This is who he's going to marry. This is what he's want, wanting. And this is what the tryouts are all about. And once they're finished, they're held off into another room or another part of the palace until the king makes his decision. Uh, that's not very popular. Everybody wants to think of this big beauty contest. And that a lot of times comes because we've taught this story to children so much. And, that's, and in a sense, it's true. I mean, it wasn't, she wasn't going to be ugly. But, I mean, there were beautiful women all over. But it was what she was going to do for him when he wanted it done. That's what this is all about. And so this guy gives Esther insights to help her. Esther 2, 16 through 17, Esther became queen in the seventh year, 479 B.C. The king loved Esther more than all the women, and she found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. But God's working through all of this. God's working through all of this to put the right people in the right place at the right time in history to preserve his people. And he continues to do that today. Esther 2, 21 through 22, Mordecai had official duties at the king's gate and one day overheard a plot to assassinate the king. In those days, while Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bichthon and Teresh, two of the king's officials from those who guarded the door, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. You don't want those who protect you being the ones that are angry with you. They're the ones that can get to you. But the plot became known to Mordecai, and he told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. Now that's providential, because later on, when Ahasuerus can't sleep, and he's reading the Chronicles, he's reminded about that and realizes he didn't reward Mordecai for doing this for him. Mordecai quickly reported the plot, and the conspirators were hung from the gallows, as it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the king's presence. Later on, that book's going to be brought out. Esther 2.23, Mordecai's faithfulness was recorded in the Persian Chronicles. Esther 3.1, a short time later, the king named Haman prime minister. As prime minister, Haman had authority over everyone except the king. Daniel may have held this position years before, since he was promoted above all the others. This may have been what Daniel had during the reign of Darius, or Cyrus, or however you view those use of those terms. 3 to b everyone had to bow in his presence, but Mordecai refused. When questioned, he explained he was an Israelite. We don't bow to anybody. Didn't pay homage. Haman's hatred was so great that he not only wanted Mordecai dead, but also all Israelites in Persia. Verse 5, when Haman saw that Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage to him, Haman was filled with rage. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him who the people of Mordecai were. Therefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews. Verse 
the satanic plan attempted to prevent the coming of Messiah by destroying all descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is all Satan had at the time. And now all he has is almost the same thing. If he can destroy all of Israel, then God can't fulfill his promises to Israel. And now we've got a, uh, we've got a God that can't fulfill his promises. Of course, Satan's not going to succeed at that, but it explains to us why we have such a hatred of the people of Israel throughout history. Esther 3, 8-9, through 9, Haman petitioned the king to enact a law to kill the Judeans on a certain day because they were troublesome people whose law caused them to rebel against the laws of the king, which was not so. Caused them to worship a different god, not worship the king. And he's willing to pay the expense, Haman is, of doing this. Haman persuaded the king to sign the law by giving 10,000 talents of silver to the royal treasury. 10 million ounces of silver. That's a, that's a lot of silver. This man had some wealth. Verse 13, Xerxes gave Haman full royal authority to murder the Jews. He gave him full royal authority to murder the Jews. All right, let's, uh, let's stop right there. It's a good break. And then we'll take just a few minutes and we'll come back and finish up.